Welcome to the On Labs podcast, and our special guest today is Ron Minnick. Ron, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Where are you? Uh, where are you coming to us from today? I'm in Livermore, California. California, nice. Where, what's the name of that city? I don't think I've ever heard of that city before. Uh, Livermore. Yeah, where? It was founded in around the mid. 19th century, literally by a guy named Robert Livermore, and um, it was a cow town for a long time, and then they put a Navy base, training Navy base here in the middle of the valley, 50 miles from the ocean, um, <laughs> and then it was kind of idle, and that's where uh, they decided to put the second atomic weapons lab, and it, on a square mile of land. And the story they like to tell is that they were afraid the Navy would want their base back. So the first building they built was in the middle of the runway. So it couldn't be used as a runway anymore. Wow. <laughs> so it was a cow town and then a nuclear weapons lab town. And now it's a largely, a, more than anything, a bedroom community for Silicon Valley. Have you been there a long time? Uh, yeah. To my surprise, I've been here 15 years, longer than I've lived anywhere which I never would have expected to actually be in California this long. Well, we're going to get to that story. And we're going to get to that story. But before we start, uh, give everybody like two minutes, uh, kind of what you're doing today. So, oh, two minutes. Um, I'm still continuing a lot of work with open source firmware, trying to open up um, and teach people about how things work at the very lowest level. Uh, I work on a... I'm giving talks actually and running a little workshop on a on a uh, piece of software I built that's based on the Plan 9 CPU command, which unoriginally is named CPU. And I also continue work on things are pretty a lot a lot of things kernel, different kind of kernel. I'm the president of the Plan 9 Foundation now, and um, I'm still heavily involved in just open source at many different levels. I had never heard of Plan 9 until I started coding in Go. Um, I, I guess Rob Pike and Russ Cox spent time working on that operating system. Until Go came along, really, that's the main thing Rob especially was known for, was Plan 9. And actually, am I seeing a slice of East Coast out your window there? I'm curious. I am in Miami, Florida. and Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> We should, I always tell Eric, our, our producer here, we should have like palm trees outside the window because we're in Miami. It just looks a tiny bit like what I, where I grew up. So, but yeah, anyway, um, Plan 9 is, is kind of, you know, it was Ken and, and, and Dennis and Rob and the, and the guys. And, uh, and they were trying to build what comes after Unix based on all, all, that we, all that we learned and how you build a distributed system and that kind of thing. And it never really quite, made it. I think in part because what I was told AT&T, there were a lot of people at AT&T who regretted that they'd ever let Unix out. And so they weren't going to let Plan 9 out. This is the way it was told to me anyway. And so they never quite really got the licensing right. And by the time they realized it was time to fix the licensing, Linux had just taken over the world. This is the late 90s. You know, by the late 90s, it was just really impractical to, even then, you're, you're fighting uphill battle if you propose to do things that, that really weren't Linux things. So this is a podcast about you, Ron, and, and kind of your, your journey to kind of where you are today. So the f first two questions I, I ask, and we're going to have to age you a little bit because we have to kind of know time frames when we talk about tech here, is... Uh, what year did you graduate from high school? <laughs> That's the first one. That's good. We can we can be keep it simple. I'm 65. To, you know, last year, uh, so I graduated from high school uh, 1975, 47 years ago. All right, 1975. Okay. That, so that's when my wife was born, and I, I graduated in 87, so I'm not okay. that, I, my wife and I, we always say we're not spring chickens anymore, we're summer chickens, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, when I, okay, so I, I, I kind of want you to just think back in your mind, the very first memory you have of working on a computer, what's that first memory that kind of comes to mind? 
so here's the background. I'm watching a, a Gemini 2 on the launch pad on a black and white TV. And it was the pretty famous launch pad aboard of the Gemini 2. And the, uh, the, the television dude says that the electronic brain had told it to not to shut down, right? And it was an engine stop. And um, that stuck in my head. I was, you know, I was single digits age back then. It totally stuck in my head, this idea that there could be this electronic brain. And that was the beginning of my interest in computing. And then I was just desperate for any way to try and figure out how to do a thing with computers. And so looking back, I realized a few years ago there was an interesting thing that was happening in the 60s. A lot of companies were moving to transistorized switching technology for communications and other such things and away from relays. And so the, the surplus market and just everybody's basement was flooded with relays. And I still have some of them. Really high quality. I, I actually gave some to a museum in Seattle a while back. But I had a gigantic amount of original inbox, never used, Potter, Brumfield, and other kinds of relays. And so I had that. But the really, really very, very, very first thing I had was this crazy little computer. It was rotating perforated cardboard wheels and you would put conductors in the form of little staples in these wheels and you would put conductors in the board they were on and you would rotate the wheels and that would make and break connections and that was how you implemented different kinds of boolean logic and then you lit or did not light a light bulb you did that at home as a kid you had this sort of kit it was sold by Lafayette Radio Electronics, which was, you know, this is all gone, this stuff, right? I even have the manual for it somewhere, I think, maybe. That was my introduction when I was still a single digits kid to Boolean algebra. So let me, let me ask you a question, because you watch this, you watch this um, thing on TV, right, and the shutdown. Do you, do you go to your parents at all and say, I'm interested in this? I want, like, did they buy you that kit from Lafayette? How does that work? That was... <laughs> so I carefully saved my pennies, and I was just a, you know, I was a fourth grader, right? I had no perspective, and and I got discouraged and just said, you know, I, I went for the short-term gratification, and I blew my entire wad of savings on candy <laughs> over <laughs> a few weeks, and my parents, you know, my memory of this is, uh, my parents are going, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I wanted to buy this little thing, and I couldn't. Get, I didn't have enough money, and I just spent it all on candy. And and they bought it for me. And and I and so then I was building little logic circuits and then OR gates. You know, with the, there was no there was, you know, a flip flop was the stored state was you turned a wheel, <laughs> right? But but I was building uh, you know these little logic circuits, and it, I think it was called a might have been called a Geniac. I don't remember anymore what it was called, but. That was kind of how you did it back then, right? And then, and then, so that was fourth grade. And then fifth grade, I started to get kind of flooded with all these random relays and, and, and really super high quality, you know, switches, literally, you know, kind of switches and things from the phone company. A lot of my parents worked, grandparents worked in the phone company, grand, you know, uncles and aunts and great uncles and aunts from when the phone company just came into being. They were literally there for when the wires went up that hooked people up in PA. And so my, my family back east, they permeated the, the phone company in the Pennsylvania area, and they would just bring home stuff, right? And, and then my dad worked at Sun Oil Marcus Hook Refinery, and all that switching had gone to electronics. So he brought home these gorgeous stepping switches from automatic electric and just amazing, amazing stuff. And I just started to assemble things. And so I built a I built a relay computer in 1969. It had eight bits of memory. Um, it had a fixed function ALU and a, and a fixed function sequencer that just ran it through a program of, well, I didn't know what the terms were, okay? But the, the, the term I later found out was load, load, op, store. Well, hold on a second. You're like 11, 12 years old when you're doing this. So two questions come to mind. One. How many times did you electrocute yourself? <laughs> and then two, where did you get the instructions for all of this? I, I just did it. I mean, I read about, I read about kind of how it had to work. 
I read about people who'd done sort of the earlier stuff with like the Geniac, and I thought, well, I think I could do this with all these weird relays and things I have lying around. And and so I used what was I used an automatic electric stepping switch as the as the sequencer. And again, I had no clue what I was doing, but um, I had a I had a way that I could say, you know, by moving wires around on a board, oh well, your first your first memory location is two because I only had eight bits, right? And and I had the I had the memories displayed on eight little bulbs on the thing. I still actually have that computer in a box somewhere, but um, and 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 so yeah, it did a load load up store, and the op could be you know an add, and then it did it one more time so you could get the carry, and you know. It it kind of worked, and then at, at the same time, the same year, I was able to talk my way into taking this senior course, senior high school course. We had access to an HP 2100, if you can imagine, from the Leesco timesharing company, and that's where I learned how to write code in BASIC. How old are you when you when you take that senior? You're still in junior high school. I was, I I was 12. Yeah, I was in seventh you were 12. grade. You were in seventh grade. Was I was that a late the, <laughs> was the junior high and the high school together, or you had to go to the this high school? Was at a, my mom was the head librarian of this really exclusive private school at Tower Hill School in Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. The history of the school is the Dupont family wasn't happy with the school situation, so they built a school in Wilmington, Delaware for their <laughs> oh, family. Why not? <laughs> like, why <yeah>. not? <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was K through twelve in one building. Which was a lot of fun, right? And um, but there was this senior class, and um, basically me and another guy, we kind of just talked our way into this being able to, you know, write programs. And the funny part is, um, we were by far the best programmers <laughs> in the <laughs> class. You know, he was he was just an incredibly smart guy. So, but this is 1970. You're, you've got a 69 like you have a I uh, I mean I, I it's like you have a personal computer sitting there in the lab or this was a no, bigger you machine would, it was dial up you had an oh, JSR 33 type okay okay you would write your program on a paper tape and then you would dial up and then it would read in the paper tape you know and your goal was like I had this goal where I tried to do it in a way that the computer would report I'd use 0 seconds of time and so it didn't charge me so I'd write the whole program out, right? And then you'd dial up real quick, feed the tape, get the result, hang up. And or, you know, and it would it would say, Oh, you've used zero time. So did they you had each student had a certain amount of time they were they were able to spend? It was more like just for fun. It was like, for fun, okay. Can I, get, right. can I get away with having it say I use zero time? It was just like in a you know, an amusing thing. I actually also have an accordion folder with all the programs I wrote back then. So that's kind of Good God, that's like 53 years ago. I I don't know. That paper's probably ready to disintegrate. That's funny. You know, I have a folder in my closet from when I was writing basic programs around when I was like in junior high school, high school. And I look at this paper and I'm like, this was a K-Pro 2. I had a K-Pro 2. It was my first computer, the CPM. And I was writing basic games. I, I can't play games. I was writing games I couldn't even play. No, I suck at games. Like I, so I, I feel your maybe I feel your pain. But you have it all still. I have the pay. I don't have the floppy disks anymore. But I've got two or three programs I've written on paper, and I look at this every once in a while, and my brain says, I wonder if I could like, t you know, I was using KPro stuff to do the graphics lines and stuff. I don't know if that would still work, but I don't know. So are you ever like, I, I feel sometimes like it might be fun to try to get these basic programs to work again. I don't know. You know, you're you're saying that just made me realize. I wonder if I could send that stuff off to it, out to it, just do the OCR for me, because really the amount of storage it represents that just just turn that into a a, a text document. It would be tiny, and it would be fun to have. That's a good idea. Um, I actually, excuse me, I have a friend who um, he's a brilliant guy, Rudolf Merak in Prague. He took the original basic from a cassette tape. And he managed to read it, pull it back in, and digitize it, and turn it into the to the basic interpreter for the original PC. And then he burned that into firmware, and he recreated the basic from the original IBM PC. You know, you know, there's just a lot of 
the reason I love being in the core boot community and the firmware community is just the people are just all nuts and they're all really top top notch smart. It's it's fantastic community. I did a little bit of low level stuff in university. The first university I went to was it was um, Dowling College. It was on a Vanderbilt property on Long Island, mm -hmm. and they were trying to teach us PDP eleven assembly on writing it on paper. And I hated it. I'll be honest with you. I was like, I want my hands on the keyboard. I don't want to be writing assembly that I can't even run. I ended up leaving the university because I, I just I wasn't into that. But I think you took. I think you did the right thing. You can't. You can't do it on paper and learn anything. I think. Yeah, that was a tough class. So you're like in junior high. You're already in a senior high school class with computers. You're you, you enter your last four years now. Your high school. So here's the next weird thing. This is the next weird diversion that happened. Um, so I'm writing programs on these on this lease thing, right? And I built my little relay computer. And there was a company called ESR in New Jersey that built little plastic computers that were really, essentially they were really what you would do in electronics, but in plastic. And so that taught me a lot more about Boolean algebra and you know how, how it worked. In fact, the education I got in that in Boolean algebra from that little plastic computer and how to program it things was so good that when I took a philosophy course when I got to college and they were doing Boolean algebra, it was like a cakewalk. Because I'd been trained, right? I'd been trained in seventh grade. Even to this day, you know, Boolean algebra is just very natural, easy thing to do. And all that all that old circuit logic design with a single gate and a flip flop is just I can still almost do it in my sleep because you that stuff sticks with you, you know. Um, but I hit this wall. And and the wall I would not have hit the wall in modern times, but the wall I hit was what do I do now? Right? I mean I there was a limit to what I could really do with computers at that time because the computers were so limited. So I took out a version. I spent four years doing cars and motorcycles. In high school? Yeah, because there was, I really had very little I could do in the way of going forward, right? You hit a wall where there's only so much you can do with a relay computer. Um, and, and there just wasn't the sort of ability to really grab a computer and do things that there is today. I was a little too early. A lot of us were a little too early. So I just decided, you know, I'm gonna have to wait till I get to college. It's clear that I can't go much further in my high school with this stuff. And I and I wandered off into doing mechanical stuff for a couple of years. But that was smart. I mean, you got to do some electronics in the car. Everything was mechanical, I guess, at that point. So, yeah, I mean, that was smart. Yeah, I, to this day, I love working on things that were not designed with computers, you know, like old steam engines and stuff like that, because you can you can really see the thoughts of the people who, who designed it. There's no intervening computation, right? It's just like you see what the people were doing. It's kind of neat. But the other thing is you can fix it. I, I, I have memories of my dad in the 70s and 80s under the car because he had to go to work and he could fix it because you didn't need the computer you weren't hooking up. You'd have, whatever it was, he could fix it and get to work tomorrow. I actually gave away every last bit of my work on car stuff um, a, while, a while back because I just realized, you know what? Cars are boring. They're iPods. <laughs> They're just not fun anymore, you know. And, and it's a, it's in a good way. They're so damn reliable and, and and just so so good in so many ways, but at the same time, there's not a lot of appeal to working on them. So I just, I gave it all away to somebody who had actually purchased a VW thing that was manufactured in 1973. And it turned out I had a ton of stuff that he was able, he could just use directly. That's how old some of these tools were, but you know, the air tools and the compressor and stuff that that's universal. You, you can always use that. So um, yeah, I'm kind of done. I've been done with cars for a while. Because yeah, computers, you can do a lot of things. They're fun again. When you're nearing the end of high school, it sounds like you 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 had already said, like, "I'm going to have to wait till I get to university." So, yeah. What are you making? What you're and you're living in Delaware at the time you graduate high school. So, where what are you thinking in terms of university choice? Well, my you know my family is pretty darn middle class, so my family is pretty middle class, and I was pretty dumb. So I'm at this top flight high school, it doesn't occur to me that, you know, if I just 
stick to it and, and plow through with straight A's, I can probably get a scholarship. It just wasn't the kind of thing that occurred to me, right? What occurred to me is uh, we don't have a lot of money. I'm going to the I'm going to University of Delaware, right? In, in fact, then if you can believe this, and I don't know, I feel I don't know how kids deal with this today. It was 600 a semester at UAD, and it was a damned good education, engineering education. So I kind of, to be honest, uh, uh, cruised through Tower Hill, not working like I should have, you know, getting. To be honest, probably B's and C's. I don't remember anymore. Uh, got into U of D. Got a. I took I took calculus, college calculus, my senior year in high school. My mom said, "Oh, you might want to do this," and and I didn't enjoy high school that much. So that was a lot of fun, going down and and, and taking, driving down the 20 minutes to U of D, and then you know being in these college course it was good preparation. And the instructor. Um, told me that I could be a computer operator at DuPont Corporation on weekends. They did that for students. They could work weekends. Oh. That was my introduction to mainframes. I was an operator on mainframes. And going right into college, I had a job carrying tapes and removable disk packs and punch card decks around and getting a look at what, at the time, the global center of you know DuPont like this was DuPont's DuPont was a huge company right it was a global company you know they give you an example they had a paint factory in Iran and they had a dedicated wire that ran from Iran back to this data center in downtown Wilmington you know and um, that was what was called a 20 milliamp loop and what that meant is 20 milliamps were going to flow no matter how much voltage you had to use to make it flow so it was like these 20 mil loops were like 400 volt <laughs> You know, they were they were like uh, serious, serious, serious um, connections. But we would get updates over this dedicated line from Iran about, you know, what would we do in the paint plant that day, right? How many cans of paint? So I got a I got a really good look at what at the time a global you know data center for a company that one of the biggest companies in the world looked like, and that was that was good. Yeah. Well, you. Okay, I have to imagine like your first day you're overwhelmed and feeling like this is amazing. Yeah. But at some point, do you get bored? I mean, you know, you would you had these tape machines, these IBM tape machines, like the window would go down because there was a scheduler for the tape and it would say put tape number, five digit number into tape drive number, three digit number, and the wind this glass window would go down and you'd put the tape in and you'd hit preset start and the window would go up and then the tape would automatically thread and feed into vacuum columns. And it was all amazing. And and you know, okay, two years of that and I was just bored to tears. So I got a job as an intern at Hewlett Packard. This is after like a couple years in university while you're studying. Yeah, I was a sophomore and, and I got a I got a job at, at um Hewlett Packard. Was I a sophomore or a junior? I guess it was a junior. Um and the first thing I did, that was a fantastic job. The, the first thing I did was build a little proto board with a Z80 on it. And all the work I'd done in high school and earlier to learn how to solder and assemble things, you know, I built this little proto board with a Z80 on it for something. And uh, they were very happy with, uh, you know, the job I did. And then within a year, within six months, actually, I was writing uh, firmware for this Z80 because Back then, every company with a microprocessor wrote everything from scratch. Hewlett Packard, you know, my my wife was there, my future wife was there, and she designed a really nice language and wrote the compiler for the language, and I used that language to write firmware for the Z80. You did everything. You had full stack. Every company had their own full stack. It wasn't like today at all. I was going to ask you what you were coding in. Was it like, was it at, a, at the assembly level, or was it C? Or I, I was also lucky because um, I, I made this transition from BASIC to Fortran, and then in 1976, UAD became one of the first external entities to have Unix, Unix version 6. So I went right into C. And Microall was very, very similar to C. It was actually a better better language, but that's neither here nor there. But um, So I did assembly when I had to, but it was always you know the the Unix manuals that we got in '76. You know their their comment that the manual page for assembler said the ultimate dead language. 
So the the thinking, you know, from '76 on is, yeah, if you're coding an assembly, you're either you're either making a mistake or you had no choice. And generally, most of the time, it's probably you're making a mistake. So that's kind of the you know the way I was brought up anyway. You finish your four years at the University of Delaware and you get your undergraduate degree. What what was that mostly focused on? Was it a programming sort of degree? Uh, no, I was in EE. So oh, double E. Courses, okay. Yeah. So the courses were around digital circuit design. I had a little bit of analog. Uh, digital signal processing had just be started to become a thing, um, and so I had a digital signal processing course. I had a really great course taught by a guy named Kimura. Um, I forget his first name. About we actually built a little operating system, and in that we did write an assembly because he wanted us to really get a feel for the lowest level. And that, that was the kind of course you take that really is just locks you into uh, having a core feeling and intuition for you know how things work. So our assignment was to write a little multitasking operating system, which we did. And he taught us a lot of the tricks of the trade for, for how to get that. What was the hardware that ran on? That's just the best part. Back then in university, it was all PDP-11s. And you know why is that? Because DEC is smart. DEC was the the seller of the PDP-11, and they said we will basically pretty much give this stuff away to universities because then students will come out and they know how to use our hardware, free training, and also they're they're aligned to be our customers. So it was always PDP-11s, you know, in that era. It was just everybody had them. It was what Unix ran on, right? So initially. We all take for granted now that our operating systems run on almost anything. Back then, you know, Unix ran on 11, and that was all you got, right? The, the portability thing didn't happen until 78, 79. And um, so if, if, if you really wanted to be at the cutting edge of computing, you were going to, like, all the research operating systems of that time kind of really ran on an 11 because they were wide open. There were people, you'd go to a conference, and somebody would say, this really happened. Uh, Berkeley said, uh, oh, we found this bug on the 11, I forget, 70 or something. And uh, we fixed it. We just put in this one wire on the one board that did this one thing. And now this instruction works better than it used to. And you did that, right? And everybody did that. You had a soldering iron next to your mini computer. That's wild. <laughs> Was there a lab with the PDP 11s in it? Or are you able to get your hands on one? Oh no, we always had our hands dirty, right? We would we would we would tear into them, and I actually still have a core plane from one of the 11s I worked on from back in the day, 64k uh, core plane I've just kept. But no, we we were we were tearing into them all the time. We designed boards for them, we uh, modified boards, we you know we did all kinds of stuff with those 11s. We were you were right inside the computer, and it was great. What were you thinking as you're about to graduate? You're with HP. Are you thinking I'm going to go stay here with with this company, or what did you want to do? I wanted to work at that time. I wanted to work on Unix, and I wanted to be at a computer company. And so let me think about this. So so I stayed at HP while I was a grad student for a while. I guess I left. It, well, I left HP a year after I graduated as an undergrad. Um, so uh, I have a question. I got it. I actually, I kind of got into a fight. <laughs> I was, I was an intern, but I had a lot of, for some reason, well, they treated me like kind of a full timer in some ways, even though I was just an intern. And I got into a fight with the head of R and D, which was kind of dumb. Um, I told him this product he was building wasn't going to work out and he didn't want to hear it. And I didn't want to shut up, which is pretty stupid when you're an intern. To argue with the head of R&D, but I did, and it became clear that you know it was time to move on from HP. So I went to a, a company called Solar Energy Systems for a while, and wrote a networking stack. And to be honest, in retrospect, it wasn't a very good networking stack. It was very inefficient. It, you know, I mean, I made it work, and it could reliably transfer files, but it it really it it followed the layered model, but in the end, it was just slow, right? But I learned a lot. I worked on a on an operating system called AOS slash VS, the data general ran, and, and that had a lot of really innovative ideas. And and it they had done a really neat job of making distributed computing somewhat transparent. 
So it it was nice to have the experience with AOS because it it hammered home the lesson that yes, Unix was neat, but it wasn't the only place to look for good ideas. But I, I, I'm I'm curious on two things here. You you're doing all this like more core hardware stuff up until you kind of graduate, right? You have the double E degree. I was expecting you to say, one, that you were thinking about NASA, because that kind of started your journey. And I would have thought you said, I want to go work at NASA. Um, and I didn't expect you to say, I wanted to work on Unix. I expected you to say, I wanted to work on hardware or some hardware. So, yeah, and that's a really good point. So, so the other part of this, I did my master's, which was a hardware master's. I, um, long story, but AMD at the time sold this, this sort of chipset that was like um, a microcode kind of processor. So you would get all these components and you could kind of put together a CPU that was a microcoded CPU. And my master's thesis was I, I designed hardware with this AMD stuff, but I had a Motorola 6809 and I wired it up so that I could essentially disable components of the pipeline and allow the 6809 to override the inputs and outputs of different stages, which allowed you to find out what was going on, because I, I implemented a single cycle clock, a thing that would let you single step it, so you could find out what was going on, and you could override the outputs to try to do sim certain simulations. This is like debugging at the hardware level? Yes. And and so I didn't know it at the time, but kind of what I built, almost like what you call service processor. But the idea was the 6809 had a lot of these what are called PIO, the PIAs actually. And and they in turn um, would would do what was called tri-state. They, they were able to tri-state the device from the AMD and substitute in, like I say, control outputs. Um, and the, and the master's thesis title was a mouthful, which was um, a highly generalized microprogram sequencer with an embedded diagnostic microprocessor. <laughs> and what I had to do for that, um, I had to design the DRAM controller for the 6809, which was, you know, it was, it was all sort of old school design with kernel maps and stuff. And I... Um, got a C compiler from a guy somewhere, I think Motorola, for the 6809, so I could write all the code in C. I wasn't going to do that assembly. And I wrote a little, you know, interactive thing with command completion to let you control the, you know, do things. And on top of that, I had to wire wrap the whole thing. So we had an all-gap wire wrap device, and I just, I just spent a couple of weeks wire wrapping this on these all-gap boards. And, um, so I was very down in the weeds with that project, right? I learned a lot from that project. And I also wrote a little system that lets you manage all the um, all the wiring using a CAD, well, using a database called MRS. I actually stored the CAD design in a database so I could more easily just, you know, look up where things were. Because there was no CAD back then, right? The CAD was pieces of vellum paper with pencil, right? So. It was a pretty big project, and I learned a lot because nobody ever did a damn thing with it, right? <laughs> I got it all working, and then it collected dust, and at some point they threw it out. So um, learned learned a lot about, like, think hard about whether anyone is going to care what you do when you're done because it's not that fun spending two years doing something and then literally have no one ever do a thing with it, right? You know, I tell I tell software developers around all the time, like, what's the legacy you're leaving behind? You don't you don't want to have a 40, 30 year, 40 year career and not have anything that's still working in the world. Like, yeah, you know, I, I, I share that all the time because it's sad to think that you can. This stuff is so disposable that if you don't engineer it right, it's exactly what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, there is no obvious person to use this once I was done that one of the one of the problems that I think people, a lot of people like me have is you, you, you kind of get a bee in your bonnet and, and it won't let you go until you're, until you do it. Right. And so you just end up being consumed by this thing you're doing. And I think, I think I, I still have that happen, right. Where I'll, I'll, I'll be unable to let something go, but I've gotten a little bit better about thinking about, yeah, if you do this though, you know, if you have someone who will benefit from what you've done.
and just think a little bit about like you're doing this thing but at the end does it end up just going on a shelf or or do you, is there someone who's going to care and and even even though every once in a while i do one of these things and nobody cares and it just goes on the shelf but that's life i guess so you did you, this did you you did this master's work right after undergraduate while you're I went right okay. into the master's program. But the other thing I did, uh, before I was done the master's, I went to work at Burroughs as a, as a hardware engineer. And um, there was a mainframe called the A15. And, and mainframes always have a service processor. And they hired me, because of my master's, they hired me to design the service processor for the A15. And so we... Um, we had to pick a microprocessor to use as a service processor, and much to my regret, I, I yielded, and we ended up with the 8086, which was always a shit show, to be blunt, um, <laughs> then and now. And it has a bunch of peripherals with a bunch of bugs that, you know, it's hard to find out what the bugs are. But I designed this, um, I designed this service processor, but this back then it was all gate arrays. Talk about, I'll, I'll tell you a really weird thing about the hardware design back then, 16 megahertz was fast. And so Burroughs, as a design technique, at that time, with Motorola emitter coupled logic, which was quote unquote fast, it ran at 16 megahertz, did a thing they called stored logic. And stored logic was a very strange thing, and it would only work for a short period of time. But the idea was, you, you need to compute a combinatorial logic function of a bunch of inputs, right? And so you can do that with a bunch of gates. But if you think about it, if you have an 8-bit combinatorial function you're trying to do, you could implement that with a piece of memory and or a piece of ROM. And so they actually used ROMs to implement combinatorial logic functions, stored logic. <clears throat> You'd never do that. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you sort of do, you do see, you sort of do that now, but it's really not kind of what people would commonly do. But it worked back then. It worked for a while. Well, what what other option did you have back then? I, I... Yeah, you didn't have the well. You didn't have you know that was just the beginnings of gate arrays, and yeah, it just it just turned out that stored logic worked for you know this particular period in time, and so we ended up with this maintenance processor uh, that that managed the A15. I worked with a guy though. He was much smarter than me at this hardware stuff. His name was Joe Schippinger. I, I'm sure he's no longer alive. Uh, and he had ideas and understanding of a level of that I just did not have about what you had to do to really um, get in and really diagnose this mainframe. So he designed some really elegant stuff, and I basically transcribed his ideas to um, to um, you know the hardware. The the interesting thing back then. That was just the beginnings of CAD. <laughs> so I had, you, you have to, you, you wouldn't believe it until you've seen it. Tektronix used to sell these green screen terminals. They were storage tube logic. It was very early graphic stuff. And it would paint, it would literally paint a picture on this green screen, cathode ray tube, and it was persistent. And you would actually have to hit a button to erase the screen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and so, so the CAD system at the time was you're looking at a screen and it paints a chip with its little pins and you put in the signal names, right? And then at the mainframe, it does this sort of connect the dots run. And then and then your design would be printed on line printer paper. I didn't I kept this for a long time. I only threw it out recently. I had a three inch thick piece of line printer paper with the design of what was called the host maintenance controller or HMC on it. And basically, you saw an outline of a chip per page printed in, you know, like you've seen CalSay, right? Like ASCII graphics, okay? And each each pin would be a, a like printed with line, you know, underlying characters with the signal name, and that was quote unquote CAD, and it, it was horrendous, right? But anyway, you know, I ended up, I I came to believe that Burroughs was kind of doomed. Um, the architecture was a stack machine. The problem of a stack machine is the top of stack is sort of like your bottleneck on all your operations. And, uh, you know, the, the, the software sucked. It, was, it had been really sort of 
leading software in the 60s and it hadn't changed much. It was called C-A-N-D-E or Candy. And I, I just thought, you know what, this, this, whole, this whole company is doomed. Their, their architecture is just terrible. Their software is terrible. They're not going to be able to work their way out of this mess. Well, they merged with Univac and later became Unisys. And somewhere, somewhere emulators for the stack machine still exist. But yeah, it, they were doomed and it was good I left. So I headed out of there. And um, from there, I went to Penn to the PhD program. And that story is kind of funny. I went to Penn to the PhD program, thought I wanted to do robotics, and discovered after a while I did not want to do robotics. And, and this, this is the thing. For anybody younger than me, you can do. You you might decide because you're do, you're, you do you can do something really well that you should do something else. And what I learned is no, I really am good at this kernel and low-level software stuff, and um, I enjoy it. And uh, what I needed to do was find a more interesting version of it. But but the Burroughs experience left me thinking. Well, I think I want to go do something really radically different. And it turned out I didn't. So. I pretty much left Penn as a grad student under a cloud because I didn't get along with my advisor. I went back to UAD to, to be a student under Dave Farber, and uh, <laughs> then Dave Farber moved to Penn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so at that point, I went in 1988 to work at a place called the Supercomputing Research Center with my wife, who also worked there. And I decided time to go back to Penn then. You know, I had. So, so I passed the PhD qualifiers at Penn. I passed by one point, by the way. So they, I walked into the room after the qualifiers. They had all the grades up on the board. They had a line through the lowest grade. And that lowest grade was my grade. And it was one point above the grade that didn't pass. And I remember someone looking at the board and said, wow, that guy just squeaked through, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I barely squeaked through. But then I didn't get along with my advisor. And I just decided, you know what, I don't want to do this anyway. So I, so I went back to Delaware and um, passed the prelims at Delaware, except that I didn't quite. I had to retake one section because I, uh, I uh, didn't quite work hard enough on the signal processing part. And so I, I was told I did very, very well on the semiconductor, tech, you know, semiconductor theory part. And I really sucked at the signal processing part. But I got through, right? Well, then it turns out my advisor is moving back to Penn. And I said, okay, I'm going to move back to Penn. I, I, I actually went almost to the way of, to, I got through everything. I was ready to propose my PhD thesis at Delaware and at Penn. But I really need to go back to Penn with Farber. He's my, he's, he's really a good guy, good, good, really top tier guy. Went back up to Penn, went back up to the office, went back to re-enroll. They said, hey, you got an F in this thing. You, you can't re-enroll. I said, I know I didn't get an F. So, you know, what's the deal? And they looked around and they found the bottom drawer of a filing cabinet, a bunch of papers they were going to throw out the next day. And there was my completion status on the course they thought I got an F in. Literally, if I'd gone up there one day later, I wouldn't have been able to go back to Penn. Things happen for a reason, right? That's, that's wild. So, so, you know, I went back. So I realized this is a long digression. But anyway, yeah, I went back to Penn, finished my PhD and uh, started at the SRC. Well, what was the PhD in though? So it wasn't robotics. What did you end up? Uh, computer engineering is what they called it. Electrical engineering, computer science. I actually don't remember. <laughs> Let me look at the wall here. But what did you study? Like, what was the material you studied? Was it more? So what happened was I was at University of Delaware and there was a guy there, Gary Delp, off the charts, another off, well, there's a lot of off the charts smart guys, right? Um, and he was doing a thing called MemNet. And MemNet was really cool. MemNet was kind of, it was what we would call a cache-only memory architecture. So the idea is we had three IBM 286s. And if you were on a 286 and you referenced some memory that wasn't local, MemNet would forward the request to whatever node had that piece of memory, get it, and bring it back. And then this 286 would finish the memory reference. So it looked like all memory was local, even though a lot of it wasn't, right? And Gary was really very early in the game on this idea. Now, this idea later was realized at a larger scale on things like Silicon Graphics Origin. As far as I know, Gary was very, very early in the game on this, with this whole idea that memory that is far away in this, in this thing can be transparently referenced and brought back. Now, 
there are two ways you could do this. One way is you, you reference that memory and it magically appears, but if, if a lot of other machines reference that memory and they see a copy and they all change it, they're not going to see each other's changes. That's the Cache market. coherency issues. Yeah. Yep. That today, that's the one that won, by the way. The one where it's not coherent is the one that won. So you look at a very high-end supercomputer nowadays. Some of those high-end supercomputers have what's called um, a global address space. And all that means is you can reference memory on someone other, some other machine's node and get it back, and you don't need to like do anything in software. But it's not coherent. Now, if you look at the Silicon Graphics Origin series, they were cache coherent. And, and they were fearsomely difficult to get right because you can imagine you can try performance through the floor if everybody's trying to participate in coherence transactions. So, but anyway, Gary did this thing. It was really cool. It was really hard. I'm not sure it ever completely worked, but it, it worked enough that his work was so good he got his PhD. Now, I was looking what he was doing and I thought, you know, First off, I don't, I'm not sure I believe, because I'd been at Burroughs, the, the CPU I worked on at Burroughs, that was the first cache coherent multiprocessor Burroughs built. So, so I had a sort of limited understanding of all this snooping traffic and all this good stuff. And I thought, you know, I don't think this approach scales, this cache coherent approach. Now I was wrong, because Silicon Graphics showed they could scale up to like, you know, large number of CPUs. So, oh well, I was wrong. but. I thought, but you know, I thought, I think I could do this in in software and get reasonable performance. And if programs were smart and didn't try and, you know, go crazy with it, they could get a thing that looked like shared memory, but under the hood I was doing it in software. And that was, um, a I called it distributed shared memory because so everybody else is going distributed shared memory. And my particular thing, I called mEther for memory over Ethernet. You know, which means I'm, I don't win the contest for picking good names. Um, <laughs> and then later, when I was at the SRC, I came up with this idea where um, I took NFS and I was able to modify NFS to support the caching transactions. And then I had so NFS actually kind of was a distributed shared memory. When you ran a program on NFS, it did an MMAP over the network and folded it in. That's that's just how it always worked. So. What I realized is, gee, all I need to do is close the loop and allow the server to tell the client that their, their page is out of date, and I've got kind of a coherency transaction there. So SunOS was really well written. It was really easy to do that, and, and so then I did it with... Uh, My brain keeps saying that the latency cost over the network would have just been horrific for performance. And, and, and so what you had to do, you had to be aware of that. And, and that was the that was the difference. That was the and I agree with you completely. Um, and and so my argument was you have to come to the table being aware that that you have this, but it hurts if you use it too much. And and if you really look in in SunOS and almost any modern system with NFS, they actually the standard way to get out a file is to mmap it. So the the funny thing people don't realize. If I have um, a network of machines with a home directory supported over any network file system, it doesn't have to be NFS, that is a distributed shared memory, but it's non coherent. We're all page folding and page fault, you know, pages from executables that are held at a server, right? And there's, but there's no coherence protocol. <laughs> so, so, it's, so I like to call that one an incoherent distributed shared memory, right? Not non-coherent, right, but incoherent, because, you know, if that binary, if the binary backing the, the executable changes, they're gonna get weird errors. So that, you know, it's never been satisfactorily solved. There are, there are half-assed solutions, but, but you know, the real solution's never been really terrific. But um, anyway, I, I, I kind of solved it. For, for limited case where you said, I'd say, well, it's going to be like shared memory, but don't go hog wild because it's not going to be very good because there's a network in there, you know. Right. Like the, the thing we say today is um, performance today is about how efficiently you can get data into the processor. How efficiently can you get data into that processor? That's, if all you care about performance, then that's a core part of what you need to care about.
Yeah, it really, the single most important component of any supercomputer is the network. And, you know, you can look at that like the, the top, the top end machine in the world right now is, is an ARM based machine they build in Japan. And the, the key, the key, that's a beautiful, beautiful machine. It is a brilliant machine. And kind of one of the key ideas is the way they've integrated the network and the, and the, the, the uh, chips themselves. It's, it's really just an absolutely fantastically well designed machine. I tell this all the time. People want to sh want me to show them how to make their program run faster, and I say I'll do it and I'll show you it's faster. But once you get back on the network, you may not feel this anymore. So once you finish your PhD, what's next? You're you. I can't remember. Where you said you were working at the time. So I was at the SRC, and I had gotten involved with the first FPGA computing device. It was called Splash. I wrote the symbolic debugger for it and, and did other work. And that was kind of fun. Um, but my, my boss was a really cool guy, John Reganati, and, and I had been in the operations department of the SRC. They weren't going to put me in research without the PhD. So I was a, I was a sysad, which was great because I did all my PhD work on the Sun workstations I was root. <laughs> so I was able to do anything I wanted with the kernel. So. I kind of got moved into the systems part, systems research part, and I was talking to my boss, and he said, well, to be honest, you can continue on this FPGA stuff, but if you wanted to, how would you feel about working on operating systems? And I said, well, you know, John, that's like the dream. And so I started getting into operating systems research. I'm curious, as they want to put you into operating system research, like, what are the big problems that are not solved at that time. So <clears throat> what I didn't realize, what I was actually getting into right at that time, supercomputers at the time, I'll give you an example. We had a Cray 2 at the SRC. It had 12 megabytes of memory, I forget. It had some number of megabytes of memory. It was it was um, four, four vector processors. It was cooled with Florener, you know, big expensive device. And we had, we had decided to start looking at what we could do with a small network of suns because that was right about the time when the clock rate of the micros started to actually get pretty competitive with the clock rate of the supercomputer and so i bought i i just um <laughs> i went into a meeting believe it or not i actually went into a meeting where i pounded my fist on the table which i i don't do that often uh, because I, I, I said, look, guys, you, you just spent $12 million on this supercomputer, and I'm asking for $40,000 for a couple of sons, it, it, you know, 16 sons, actually. Um, and I, I just want to take these sons and try and attack some problems that I think can be attacked. And so the head of the, head of the projects group was an awesome guy, Fred Moore. And he said, I'll get you your money. You know, when I lesson learned, right? I walked in with quantitative data and it was impossible to ignore the fact that we claimed to be a systems research outfit and we I couldn't even get one one thousandth of the money they spent on an applications machine to do systems research. So at that point it was sort of, yeah, this is ridiculous. Let's get you some money. So I built um, one of the very, very first workstation clusters ever. This was 1991 or 1990. And then I showed that I could handily beat the Cray machine on non-vector apps. And there were, you know, anytime you looked at what was running at the supercomputing centers, they were largely non-vector apps. So that was the beginning of my work in the 90s around showing that clusters could really do the job. And so the MNFS work, the memory NFS work that made kind of a distributed shared memory with NFS was part of that. But there was also uh, one of the things I learned, I had um, this 16 node cluster and I ran this um, radiation transport application on it, right? And, and, I, and I'd run it and I'd only get, you know, about 14 and a half machines worth of, of throughput, right? And I looked and I realized, wow, 
I was using, uh, you know, standard command line tools to start these things up. And, and, and that overhead was just enough that it was killing my scaling. And so I built tools that let me start, you know, those 16 nodes up in around, you know, like milliseconds. And then I got the scaling. Um, that's not, that one lesson about efficient startup hasn't always been, people haven't always paid attention to it. But the way they get around it is they ignore the startup overhead when they show their scaling numbers. That that used to be more common. It isn't really as common now. But um, that was the beginning of a lot of work I did, though, in the in the 90s through about 2005 on sort of cluster infrastructure, how you, what the software looks like, you know, what it does, that kind of thing. When you say, just, just to step back, so I'm, when you say, Cluster, you're you're sharing all these CPUs to to execute that program, or I I bought sixteen Sun Spark Station systems, and they had an integrated. That was the Sun with an integrated monitor, so it was a monitor with a Spark Station board in the back. I actually designed, and then Fred and and two other guys and I welded together these racks that held those monitors in a four by four grid. And and so the other thing I kind of did on the side was invent the clustered tile display. You know, I looked at that and I said, well, wait a minute, this is this looks like one monitor with a lot of wide bars in the middle. And then I so I so I built the software that would let me display, you know, postscript and images and stuff on that. That was the that was again, that was about yeah, that was about nineteen ninety one. So I think I was the first person to actually implement one of those things. I mean it's old school. It's it's not there's nothing new about it anymore. Everybody does it, but I think I was the first one. At the time you're building this stuff, even at a research level, is there any concept of open source? Is there any concept of sharing this back to others? That's where it gets interesting. So if we go back to the 70s, we all at the universities had source to Unix, and we all traded it back and forth. And that was a, that was a garden because we could only really trade it back and forth to companies that had the license. But Kernighan, or Kernighan, um, released, Kernighan and Flogger released a book called Software Tools, and the software tools were available for the cost of almost like um, send a note to Prentice Hall and you can get the, the code. So that was kind of the beginning for me of what people called open source because the, the software tools you got you were allowed to show, share with people and show them things, right? And then through the 80s, you know, it, uh, uh, Stallman got frustrated and started the, the you know, Canoe uh, Foundation. That was about 83. And so that began to grow. It was really only Emacs for a while, but then GCC came along in 88 and that started to crack things open a little bit. Even then, a lot of my work was messing about with SunOS, and so releasing my stuff as open source was not in a cards. But what I did do, a lot of user mode stuff I wrote, I, I made available on FTP servers. We didn't have anything like, you know, even the early source words didn't exist. So what you did is you made a tarball up and you found a friendly FTP server, dropped it there. The web didn't exist. You had to tell people where to look in the talks you gave or emails, right? But then in 94, Mosaic comes along, and now, now it starts getting interesting. So open source, we kind of knew, we kind of were thinking in terms of open source in the 70s without knowing what we were thinking about. And we were trying to give people our code within the limits of what was possible. And then in the 90s, all kinds of stuff broke open, right? The compiler broke open first, but then BSD and, and, and Linux came along, and that broke open the kernel. and you know, the GNU bin stuff and the, and the command line utilities came along. And so we, we gradually just kind of cracked open bit by bit the, the source code for all this stuff we were using. I, I remember, I think it was 1996, when I walked into somebody's office and I was like, what are you doing? And they're like, I'm dialing up on the internet. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, zero clue what the internet was, zero clue about dialing up and then seeing the basic browser, my brain exploded. Like, do you remember the first time you've heard about the internet or saw it like live like that? 
Well, I mean, the first time I saw it was the 70s because it was the ARPANET and it was small. But, you know, what did you have? You had FTP and Telnet. So it wasn't much. But but you did have the idea that there's a thing far away that you can get to and, and get stuff from it. Now, there's a great book called The Elements of Networking Style. And the author of that book makes a really critical, critical point. In the 70s, we had a choice of going with remote access or resource sharing. Remote access is what we're all used to today. Telnet, FTP, SSH, right? I'm here and I go there and I see what's there, but it's not here, it's there, right? And why, why is the internet that way? Well, there was, a, there was code in the 70s to implement resource sharing, meaning I may be there, but all the stuff from, from where I came is, is still visible. Or I'm here, but all the stuff on that thing is visible to me as though it was here, even though it's over there, right? There was a thing that I haven't, I've, I, I keep forgetting to go find a reference called the Resource Sharing Executive that was done in the 70s. And, and the, the author of that book says, well, why didn't we go with that? Why didn't we go with resource sharing? And his, his summary is kind of, well, because it was, was hard. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so we kind of took the easy way out and any i my feeling is he views that with a lot of regret with a lot of regret so so the internet took a form in the 70s that's kind of not a great in my view form but it is what it is right but no i had it but so in the 70s we had it and a 56k line was considered impossibly fast and some really rich people had megabit lines and then, you know, you kind of roll through the 80s and Barber and others start the Gigabit Network Alliance in about 86. And, um, and, and you know, that, that kind of happens and, and they, they start this whole concept of the NSF net and all this stuff. And even then, you know, we still had all this. We still had FTP and Telnet and, you know, stuff. And, um, and then the, the thing that cracked it open for everybody, I think you mentioned this, is the browser. You know, the browser was sort of, the thing that let you organize your brain around the resources. And and the funny thing, if you ever read Bill Nelson's book, Computer Lib from the 60s, so you want to get that. You can still find copies of it. I, I looked hard to find one and bought it on Amazon. Ted Nelson, Ted Nelson, Ted Nelson, I'm sorry. Um, and um, hang on a minute. I'm going to quick. He was a really important figure in computing. And he invented, yeah, there. I just looked him up. Ted Nelson. Um, nope, wrong Ted Nelson. Oh, yeah. No, that is right, Ted Nelson. He basically arguably invented hypertext. You know, and HTTP is hypertext transport protocol. He he was brilliant. He had a lot of ideas that I thought were nuts that are common today. I'll give you an example. He said, when you're working on a document, as you're typing the document, we should save every version of the document as you type, like literally character by character, right? And I thought, Oh, come on, Ted, that's that's just nuts, right? Now when I use Google Docs, guess what? I've got every version of the document. And 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 so he was he was an amazingly forward thinking guy that I think is not even people know about him, but very, very interesting guy. Computer Lev is a fun book. And uh he inspired me when I read that book because the one key part of his book is we need to understand what's going on at every level. And the companies that sell us the computers don't want us to. So, you know, it was a very 70s book, too, 60s, 70s book. We need to take it back. I mean, the cover of the book is a clenched fist, right? <laughs> but it's just fun as hell. It's a really great read. Gets, let's get back to Yeah. by the year 2000, it sounded like you were ready to move on and do something. So what happened, that was a weird story. So the, I'm at the SRC, and in 90, 94, the, the sponsor... Um, says, well, we're going to re we're going to repurpose the SRC, and we decide, and, and our boss has left and gone to a place called um, David Sarnoff Research Center in Princeton, and kind of kind of convinced us to be a good idea to go there. So we went there, and I spent that was the worst job of my entire life. <laughs> oh my! It was a contract R and D lab, and let me tell you, that is a brutal, brutal existence. Because basically, uh, you account for your time in increments of 15 minutes, and you've always got, always got to have a contract to cover your time. So the Sarnoff 
David Sarnoff Research Lab, founded in 1941 by David Sarnoff, when RCA was like the biggest consumer products company in the world. It was that until the 70s. Invented color TV. One of the first things that he he uh, provided to the U.S. Army was the sniper scope. So they 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 have a long list of really critical things they invented, like the liquid crystal display. When GE bought RCA, GE took the patents from RCA, which had funded the David Sarnoff Research Lab, and then cast the lab out. So Sarnoff began life with no money. That was a brutal five years. And um, that was one of those times, and it's good to remember, <laughs> you can make a near career ending mistake and recover. So we, you know, um, anyway, I got serendipity. I got a chance to go to a thing called the Sal Shan Conference in 1998. And I gave a talk about the clustering work I had gotten funded at the Sarnoff Lab by an ARPA contract. And I made connections with some people from Los Alamos National Labs. And, you know, it was just a good deal. They wanted to hire me to go do more clustering work at, at Los Alamos. So my wife and I headed out to New Mexico. And I continued the uh, clustering work at, at Los Alamos and started a project that over the, over the years had various names like Science Appliance or Clustermatic, take your pick. And 99, when I moved there, is when I invented Linux BIOS which became core boot. So that was, the reason I did that is I had worked on a hardware board, hardware networking board at Sarnoff, and I'd learned a lot about PCI, and I realized that the days of little cards with dip switches, thank God, were gone. And you could completely configure your platform from that early startup code, and I thought, fine, I don't need the BIOS though. I'm a, I'm a supercomputer. All I need to do is start Linux quickly and get out of the way. So I started Linux BIOS and um, we were able to take a cluster where the nodes took five to six minutes to boot and get them to the point where they were booting in three seconds into Linux and, and, and starting up. But the, the BIOS to me was always, it was an API, right? It's a really low level API for accessing IO. Yeah, and you don't need it. That, that what Linux had shown, and there was even a quote in the Linux at the time, sadly it's gone, which is, we don't need no stinking BIOS. You know, the line from, uh, from yeah, Treasure. Yeah, we don't need no stinking right? badgers. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I looked at that and I thought, I, I had actually spent eight years, at, you know, in the 90s being frustrated with the state of the firmware. And, you know, true story, the Sunfork console the text mode console on the Sun 4 ran at about 900 baud. It was it was unbelievably slow, right? And it was so slow that people who wanted a text mode console would run the Sun windowing system with one giant window just so they could get reasonable performance on, on text mode, right? And it was because of the firmware. There was a bug in the firmware. They finally worked the bug in the firmware out after, I mean, it took them years to figure out, you know, why is the text mode console on the sun so damn slow? And, you know, for what it's worth, they forgot to turn caching on in the firmware, <laughs> memory caching. So the, the, the firmware had been a thorn in my side, and then the BIOS was an even worse thorn in my side. And, and I just thought, I, I don't really see a way to fix this, so I'm just going to get rid of it. And I had been, you know, I had actually written BIOSes in the 70s. I knew how to do it. I'd written one at Burroughs for the host maintenance controller. It, I had written one for my master's thesis for the 6809. It was like old, old news to me. And so I got, I got the motherboard docs. I went to developer.intel.com for the chipset docs because back then Intel would give you chipset docs at developer.intel.com, which doesn't really happen anymore. And uh, I wrote, I wrote Linux files and, and it, I got a lot of help from smart people. Stefan Reinauer had written uh, our, our, our first sort of Proof of concept, and then um, um, we took Johan Rydberg had written like a slightly better one in C, and so we kind of worked with that. But the, I think that my big contribution was not realizing that I couldn't do it, <laughs> and and so I I, I kind of took their stuff, and and the the key thing I added is I'm just going to start a Linux kernel in the BIOS. I don't need all this other crap, right? I'll just start a Linux kernel. 
but then how am I going to boot the next Linux kernel? And so that's when I um, came up with this idea that a Linux ought to be able to boot a Linux. And I, I called it Lobos. Now, people looked at my implementation and didn't like it very much. So, you know, Werner Olmsberger, who wrote a thing called Lilo, and Eric Biederman wrote a thing called KXAC, and, and Eric Hendricks at NASA wrote a thing called Two Kernel Monty. And if you look, the thing that eventually won was Eric Biederman's KXAC. But, you know, we take for granted now that Linux can boot Linux. But, you know, I, the, the, my first implementation in 99, I ran into one of the guys who was the big, one of the big Linux figures at the time, and he said, there is no way in hell you will ever get anything like this in a Linux kernel. <laughs> Lesson learned. Three years later, it was in the Linux kernel. But, um, you know, the initial reaction was nobody will ever want to do this. You know, of course, now everybody wants to do it. So, so is the Mac, you know, the, again, I'm not, not that level. I, I, I worked on Windows for 20 years, and I could just turn the machine on, walk away, and go get some coffee. And then when I moved to Mac, and it booted up so quickly that I didn't even have time to get out of my chair, my brain exploded, right? Like, now I take that for granted. Is that some of the same sort of technology? Yeah, Apple is very much their own thing, and they really own um, everything, so they can make it. And, and you know, back in the day, if you, if you made anything slower, Steve Jobs would have you into his office for a conversation. So, so there has always been this... Um, Apple has never been willing to sacrifice the quality of something like boot time for whatever the hell Microsoft sacrifices it for. And, you know, true story here, the low-level firmware that runs includes this thing called ACPI. And a couple of years ago, ACPI was extended. I think it was version 5 or version 6, so that you could put up a boot screen, a thing that looked like a login screen. That's right. So you, you turn on a computer, or it, it comes back from suspend and resume. You you get what looks like a login screen, but if you if you ever look carefully, you discover you can't really log into it. Right? That's actually a fake login screen. It was done to make it look like the machine was booting fast when it's not. Wow. Yeah. I, <laughs> Illusion. Really, really dishonest. Yeah. I think the championship though for for power on to login is still the Chromebook, and that is booting a full up Linux image with a full up Linux you know system five based script startup thing called upstart and i have with other work i've done gotten that down to two and a half seconds so it it there's no the only reason it's slow is nobody cared enough to make it fast honestly but it could always have been fast but it's life-changing having a machine move uh be ready that quickly after yeah it, so let's uh, <sighs> So what happens now after you spend time here at this research company working on, on this stuff? So Sarnoff, so I left Sarnoff, went to Los Alamos National Lab. That was a great gig right up through about 2005 or so. And uh, we did a lot, we did a lot there. But uh, once again, I, I, uh, there were a few, few errors I made in all that, which were interesting. So I assumed that Linux BIOS was such a good idea that it wouldn't be a hard sell to the computer industry to, to get them to pick it up. But what I didn't realize is a lot of companies didn't want information about how things worked at that level made public. So it turned into a battle royal. It just turned into a, into a nightmare of, of every iteration trying to get companies to be willing to let us ship Linux files. But is it a security issue? Is it some sort of IP issue? Is it what? What is it? Uh, there's 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 a lot there's a lot there are a lot of threads. There's no single thing. There are just a lot of factors. So I'll give you an example. Um, there is a lot of there's a huge organization that a company like Intel that's that's structured around we should all run UEFI. All right. So well, Linux BIOS essentially replaced UEFI or 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 you know, UEFI wasn't needed if you had Linux files. Well, that's their salary. <laughs> that part of it. So there's that. There's the people at Intel who think that anything, nobody should know anything about how these chips work. And, and there's a part of a justification for that. So Intel, let's just say Intel ships code that enables their chipset, turns it on, does stuff, right? If you do the wrong thing, you can do, you can mess up the chipset. And and you can do it in ways like give me an example. You you might let's just imagine you do it in a way that causes floating point errors. 
Well, Intel took a lot of flack in the 90s for that, for the floating point error. It was, you know, part of the chip. I mean, I had a cluster in the 90s. Uh, Intel sent me replacement CPU for every cluster CPU because of the floating point problem. So there are a lot of bugs in these chips that firmware patches up to not be bugs. And I, I'm going to say, I think this is a legit. There's, there's a certain degree of legitimacy in this concern that somebody would get a board, they would load their own firmware on the board, the board would malfunction, they would blame the vendor. Because who wouldn't? People always blame someone other than themselves. Now, my attitude on this has always been that I think it's it would be better if, if the BIOSes were all open source, but I'm, I don't own a chip company. <laughs> so... No, I, I, you would think they could just do it as a warranty issue. If you touch the firmware, you're, you're, you lose your warranty. Don't don't talk to us. Yeah, and I, I have a lot. I I was not super sympathetic in the 2000 time frame. I think I'm a lot more sympathetic to this kind of issue than I was back in the day. But at the same time, what I see overwhelmingly is people don't much like the BIOSes that come with commercial x86 systems, and the vendors haven't been super responsive. So. I can understand them wanting to say there are certain things we're not going to release publicly. No problem there. What I what I've never really been happy about is they say so you're going to do it our way or else, which is kind of the the UEFI uh, model. And so, but in any event, uh, so that was a mistake I made where I thought people would really pick up on this. I didn't realize kind of how long and how hard the pushback on that, which has been 23 years, would be. I mean, the second thing is. We built a really good clustering stack. So to give an idea, uh, we could boot a 1,020 node machine cluster in a few minutes as compared to 20 minutes for the best competitor at the time, and 20 minutes would have been fast. Uh, we could start a 1,000 node MPI job in two to three seconds, which was far, far faster. And, and that included the scheduling overhead, so we could really, really roll stuff out quickly. But we didn't manage we didn't we didn't really manage the marketing of that very well. So we won the day at Los Alamos for for about eight years. Clustermatic was the standard clustering stack at Los Alamos. We were competing with a lot of stacks, at least in my view, that weren't nearly as good, but were much better marketed. But that's the case with a lot of things, right? Yep. And and I was pretty naive. You know, I've always been naive about the importance of of, of getting out there with. <laughs> With the marketing, partly because, like a lot of engineers, I don't. It's not something I really enjoy doing. But you know, I've gotten a little bit better about trying to do it. But and and one of the lessons for anyone listening here, you know, you, you sometimes tend to think if you if you tell people once and they listen, then you've done it. But you literally have to tell them about 300 times before the message starts to penetrate. And we didn't. For a while, we were out and about giving talks, and we did one of best open source. Cluster software award or some such in 2004, but we we um, we didn't do it enough, and so the you know the so clustermatic kind of went away. And and the other thing, there were a lot of changes in the management of Los Alamos National Labs, and and by 2005 we were we were actually losing some pretty critical people, and uh, so the whole thing kind of I guess would say disintegrated in flight. So we we had a good we had a good run there through 2005. I left in 07, and uh, that was pretty much kind of the end of a lot of my mainline cluster research work, which I ran from about literally 1990, really 1989 through about 2005 or six or so, and then it was time to go do other things. Yeah, like so. What's on your radar then? At that, you you spent an, an almost a career just on that. Yeah, Two th I mean, 2007, eight. Well, I always see that as the mortgage crisis, so everything's imploding economically. But I'm trying to think tech in 2008. What what was interesting you at that point? Clusters were old hat by that point, right? They were just assumed. Linux was old hat. There really wasn't anything exciting. And and the other thing that happened was interesting. We saw an Atlanta Linux symposium in 2000, a talk by a guy at Google. And we looked at the scale of what they were building and kind of thought, yeah, it's nice, but it's not very big. And by, by 2007, Google had blown by and, and just left the DOE supercomputing cluster work in the dust. You know, by, 
2005 uh, or so, Sandia built what they thought was a big cluster, which was you know 4,000 machines, which was like a rounding error for a company like Google by that time. So, you know, if you really, really looked, a lot of the initiative and momentum and interesting work had left the DOE labs for places like Google at that point. So clustering was kind of done. Now, the other interesting thing that happened, the, the pendulum swung back to large custom machines like the IBM Blue Gene or the Craze, you know, or again, I mentioned the Japanese machine, the Fugaku. If you really, really look at the top, top, top machines, they're not clusters the way they were around 2000. They're, they're very carefully crafted custom machines that to, to essentially you can't buy. So it was clear that, you know, I was kind of out of that game. So I, so I was in a, the new thing, the two new things were one, I was working with a guy at IBM on the blue gene and with the folks at Bell Labs, and we had ported Plan 9 to the blue gene. So 2006 or so, actually, we were the first organization outside IBM to get a kernel running on blue gene that wasn't one of IBM's kernels. It wasn't Linux, it was Plan 9, but we demonstrated it in 2006. So why, why that project? I'm kind of interested. Like, why that project? So what happened there was I was having an argument with a guy named Barney McCabe a few years prior to that. And he was arguing that we should have a special purpose kernel on a machine like a blue gene, a kernel that was only there to do HPC. And I was saying, well, I don't know, Barney, we've had good luck with Linux on, on the supercomputers we're building, supercomputers we're building. And he said, I don't know why you need a file system in a, in a kernel on an HPC node. So I, I kind of had to accept that he had a good point there. And I went back and I thought, well, Plan 9 is a really nice minimal kernel. And I, I knew some of the guys at Bell Labs anyway. And it's not a special purpose, you know, snowflake, like some of the kernels that have been built for high-end supercomputers. It is a general purpose kernel, but it's not a Linux kernel where it's got everything, you know, it's not a like the, the dumping around for every random idea people have. It's a pretty tight, small, compact kernel and give you a rough number back then it, and even now it builds in three seconds because it's so small. And so I thought, let's take a look at this thing and see if I apply measures to it that I apply for HPC nodes, how it does. And so there's one measure we have where we measured it, how much the operating system interferes with your app. Because at scale, if you have a, a couple thousand machines and there's a little bit of interference on all thousand machines, all of a sudden, your $100 million computer is running like an $80 million computer because of all this little bits of interference. And to give you an idea of how minor it can be, on the on the 30, on the the 30 20 teraflop machine at Los Alamos, they forgot and left the line printer daemon running. The line printer daemon was waking up on 2,000 nodes once every 30 seconds. So two times a minute, it would wake up and say, do I have anything to do? No, I have nothing to do. Go back to sleep, right? You'd think, well, okay, fine. What is that going to do? Well, what that's going to do is burn a quarter of the performance of the machine because they're all waking up every 30 seconds, but it's a slightly different every 30 seconds. And there is just enough interference with the MPI supercomputing app to really slow it down. Plus, you're not doing real work anymore. You're doing that work. You're doing that work, and it's like a couple of milliseconds of work every 30 seconds. That adds up. So it adds up. So Plan 9 had far better numbers for for lack of interference than linux like really good and so we thought okay let's see what it takes to port this to blue gene and we got that port done thanks to people like aaron von hensbergen when he was at ibm and the late jim mckee at bell labs and charles forsyth charles forsyth at vita nova we literally got that port done in well under a month and i actually did i i got to do the MMU code one night. I got that MMU code done in an hour. Charles Forsyth really later cleaned it up, but it worked. And so we had a working port to Blue Gene of Plan 9 with the resource sharing model, mind you, in, and we demoed it live. And the way we demoed it, Eric, Hen, er, Eric von Hensbergen had a brilliant demo. He said, hmm, my mail file is at this machine in Texas. 
the mail file program reader is in a machine in New Jersey, I'm going to run, I'm going to look at my mail in the blue chain. And because of the fact that of what's called location transparency that you get with a distributed operating system, it worked first time with no nothing different. You just did it. So that's what we showed. And the the program manager at the time of what was called the Fast OS project wanted to see something innovative done in operating systems, right? Not just another Linux port. Now, in the end, in the end, in spite of the fact that we did a lot of stuff right, Linux won. Linux was what people wanted. And, and this is another thing that nobody really foresaw because nobody thought about it because it hadn't really been a thing before. But being able to run your program on your workstation and then essentially run it again on the supercomputer, that had never worked, but it, it started to work. And nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to recompile. Literally, no one wanted to recompile a program so they could run it on the supercomputer. So that was another, you know, Linux, Linux was this incredible steamroller that just crushed everything in its way in the 2000s in the supercomputing world because of all these different reasons. And then, and then further, an interesting thing in the Linux community, if you can convince them that you're, you're seeing a real problem, like once, once they realize that you're talking about something that they need to care about, they've, they've shown this ability to adapt and, and address the problem. And it, it's really just an amazing thing to watch. It, uh, it is. Um, I'm sorry. How much of Linux being able to run on maybe general commercial hardware helps there, right? I mean, that's what helped Microsoft, but they were able to run on kind of general hardware. Well, so there is a machine that Cray built called the T3D, T3 series, and T3E, I mean. And well, it was the, the, the the, the real name was Red Storm, so Red Storm, whatever. Um, that was basically Opterons and the best network you could ever imagine, right? This incredible network. So a guy named Dave Dillo, who's now at Google, when he was at Oak Ridge, he wrote an environment where you could run a little emulation of a very small version of that supercomputer on your desktop and just kind of test out, am I roughly getting it right? Are my communications roughly right? He actually emulated the hardware of the network, right? And, and this is not like an Ethernet. This is like I can do a remote get put over this multi hundred, you know, or, or multi gigabyte per second network, right? You know, and and so you really want to get that code right. So Dave Dillo wrote this thing that let him run an app that ran directly on the supercomputer, binary compatible, on his workstation, do some verification, and that was worth a lot. It wasn't even a simulation, right? And and so yeah, it was it was really very valuable. And there's just a couple of key decisions Linux has made over the years that have really made it thrive in ways other things have not. So what what happens now after you finish this Plan 9 port? Security was getting to be a big concern. And so I had this thought, because I'd gotten very interested in virtualization starting around when Zen came out. But I had this thought that we could build a not very big cluster, just a couple hundred nodes, and we could run many VMs on each cluster node and then run malware at scale of kind of an enterprise and study it. So that was called emulytics. It was emulation and analytics. And so we had some extraordinarily good people at Sandia, California, where I worked, who had done some of this culturing. And so we, we put together this cluster and we put together sort of a runtime written in Go. And the nodes were running very, very, very minimal Linux install, literally pretty much just a kernel and a daemon written in Go. And we were able to run 80,000 Windows instances on this 400 node cluster and run malware at scale and study it. And the, 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 fright, the thing that scared people was they would say, can you guarantee the malware won't escape? So we had to guarantee the malware wouldn't escape. No, I was that, that was my next question. Like this machine was isolated, no networking connections. <laughs> we, we isolated it well enough. And, and but the other thing we did, the the the, um, the physical network was structured as like a tree. So there was a root of a tree that fanned out to switches that then fanned out to the terminal nodes. And 
the fan out, I believe the factor was 20, something like 20, 20 at the top, and then each each switch of had 20. That gets you to 400. So I wrote code that that structured the communications to match the physical topology of the network, and that in turn allowed us to distribute this gigabyte of Windows ISO image in under 30 seconds. You know, you would you would you would start to distribute it and you would see every single network switch like go orange at the same time continuously for 30 seconds and at that point the gigabyte image had been distributed so the the lesson here was you could get fancy and go with you know broadcast and and all these other crazy things but if you embedded knowledge of the topology of the network in your program you could create efficiencies that were unbeatable right we were running at wire speed for the time it took to distribute it, we kept that ISO in memory. Uh, some very, very smart other people at Sandia, uh, a guy named David Fritz, um, used the kernel same memory code in Linux, which lets you merge pages from different VMs into one, and that allowed us to ramp up to running a lot of Windows images. And we, we extended this thing called the KVM tool, so it had graphics, and, and so here are some prizes. I'm running 200 Windows images on a machine. And so I think, well, I need to, I need a virtual clock that I down, right, I down rate by about factor 200 because they're going to think that the machine's super slow, right? We learned it didn't matter. We didn't need to do anything. And, and so we thought, well, why is that? Why is it that all the Windows machines are super happy with one 200th of the machine they're on? And it turned out, what does Windows spend most of its time doing? It spends most of its time waiting for you to click a mouse or hit a keyboard. So from its point of view, it's never doing anything anyway. And, and so we found out that we had 80,000 Windows instances running. We were culturing the malware. The malware ran fine. They actually found bugs in the malware. <laughs> when, they, when, we, when we gave it that many machines with that good connectivity, it did some things wrong, which was pretty funny. But we learned a lot about, you know, what 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 could be done. So that activity actually continues to this day. My concern would have been memory because Microsoft always seemed to be an operating system that wanted to load a lot of stuff in memory. That was the trade-off, right? We'll put a lot of stuff in memory and we'll run better that way. But like memory should have been an issue for you. Yeah, it should have been. So the machines had 12 gig, which was, you know, at that time, a lot of memory. And, and but the key, key, key idea was David Fritz's use of the kernel same memory code in Linux to merge pages. And so the way he did it was super clever. They would, and I'm going from my memory here because this, is, this goes back a ways, um, but you would fire up some VMs, do a kernel same memory pass to merge pages, then fire up more. So you would slowly ramp up and, and stop at plateaus and merge memory. It was really super clever. That's super clever because then everybody's sharing that same, let's say you needed four gig, <laughs> you, everybody had it without it multiplying. Yeah, that's brilliant. And then they, they made sure the Windows had a pretty minimal footprint anyway. There were tricks they knew how to play too because they'd already been doing this for a while. So there was the, the final thing I did at Sandia was this project called Nix. And it was based on something that everybody thought would be happening. So imagine you have a die with like 500 cores on it. And really, if you think about it, all those cores are able to run a kernel in user mode and deal with interrupts and do all this stuff, and it's really expensive. And so he said, what if we just said on this, on, on this machine with um, n by n cores, so n squared cores, only n of those cores actually are going to run the kernel? What, what would the operating system look like? And so in 2011, I got lucky. I got to spend a week in Madrid working with some really good people. And what Nix was, was a modified plan on kernel where we said, you know, only square root of the number of cores run a kernel and the rest are what we call application cores. And the application cores, you put a process on them and you just leave it there. Process is, is it's a voluntary, not, a, not an involuntary preemption because we're gonna have so many cores, and this is true in plan nine, we have so many cores that we don't have enough processes to use them all. So, so we're just gonna let them sit there and when they and they'll run, and when they need an operating system service, they will literally bounce back. In some sense, they will bounce back to a thread on the 
what we called the kernel core and do the, the kernel thing they need and then bounce back to running on the app core. So it was a bounce back and forth kind of thing. And those application cores were actually theoretically perfect from the point of view of noise. I, I have an app that I've used for years to measure this stuff and they were literally zero noise. This is almost like a operating system as a service at the hardware level, right? Like yeah, and, and so we were really kind of recreating what IBM calls logical partitioning, but the difference was we said there shall be no kernel code on an application core because the model is we can't even run kernel code on the application core. Now, there's always a little kernel code because when you voluntarily yield the core, you've got to drop into like this sort of mini kernel that says, oh, you're giving up the core, fine. You don't really give up the core until you say I'm completely done and I'm exiting. But you sort of say, well, I need to do something, so you need to move my context, not really move it, but you need to resume my context on a kernel core so I can do this kernel thing. So that was really nice work. Um, what we didn't, and I certainly didn't anticipate, there are, we have things called application cores now. That actually happened, but they're called GPUs. So, so we had this idea that there would be a sea of cores, but, but what the, the part we missed was there is a sea of cores, but they're, they're GPU cores, and there's a small number of sort of ARM or x86 cores steering the sea of cores. But, but our model was a good model, but it's the wrong model for the way technology has evolved. So that was kind of the last thing I did at, at, at Sandia. That's just super interesting. Now you're getting into scheduling and stuff like that, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was a very simple scheduling model because it's all voluntary, right? We were trying to move to voluntary. Oh, like a cooperating scheduler in a sense. Cooperative just... scheduling. Okay. And and that was a good. We didn't plan it that way, but that turned out to be a good match to Go anyway, because Go is is sort of cooperative. You don't see it, but Go underneath is a cooperative. In in fact, Go underneath the whole Go model came from Plan Nine Threads, which which isn't talked about a lot. Uh, but the the go the entire go model in terms of channels and 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 go routines is an exact implementation of the plan nine threading model you know kind of brought forward to a modern language yeah a couple of years ago they actually went more preemptive because they've been doing so much optimizations around inlining yeah that the cooperative scheduling was starting they could see the the they could see what was going to happen. So they, they've actually implemented a lot, a lot of operating system techniques now. That's into interesting. The scheduler. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't been paying attention. That's interesting. I didn't know that at all. That's, that's interesting. So that, that gets us to like 2010, 11. All right, we got like 15 minutes left. And there's so yeah, much. Yeah, we got to wrap up. Yeah, I, I don't want to keep you much longer than 15 minutes. But I, I, I'd love to, yeah, let's maybe we speed up a little bit to, to get to where you are today. So Corbett had died. Linux BIOS and Core Boot had kind of died. It was really not used anywhere anymore. And Stefan Reiner had moved to Google. And uh, the core, the original Chromebooks were UEFI, and there was a very unsatisfactory experience. And someone realized, hey, this Stefan guy, he's the Core Boot guy, because he'd taken over from me in 2006. Um, wonder if we could make Core Boot work on a Chromebook. And that was 2010, they asked him to do that, and he's, pretty damn smart guy. He got it done in like six months from from zero. And it was a very, very different port than it had ever been done before. So he was talking to me. And he said, you ought to come here. You know, we're Corbett's kind of coming back to life. And I, I'd been very excited by the Chromebook anyway. I thought it was a really neat idea. So I ended up at Google and I ended up working on Corboot. And, and the thing I did, I, I kind of started right at the beginning of 2012. And by the end of 2012, I said, you know, it's only on x86 Chromebooks. There's no reason it can't be on ARM Chromebooks. So that's when I kind of kicked off the ARM port. And that's when Core Boot became multi-architecture again. So it had had Alpha and PowerPC, but that all got removed in the 2000s because there were no users. And so it, had, it kind of narrowed down to just being x86. And so with the ARM, we brought it back. And then since that time, uh, the, the, the scope of different ports. There's now a Power 9 port for, for Core Boot. There's uh, MIPS. You know, there are more and more ports. There's RISC-V port. I did the first RISC-V port in 2014 for Core Boot. So it is um, kind of grown again. 
and yeah, we are running out of time. So, so then what happened in, in, in 2015, remember Linux BIOS was Linux and Flash, but then Linux got too big to fit in the Flash parts. So we, we ended up with things like Etherboot and, and other, you know, booter, boot programs in Flash, but not Linux and Flash. But, but this is the only thing I'll ever say I like about UEFI. It forced the Flash parts to be really big because UEFI is big. And I realized, wait a minute, they have a 60 megabyte Flash part now. I can't do core boot on these servers, but I could take UEFI, throw most of it away, and replace what I threw away with a Linux kernel. And that was the Linux boot project, which I started in, in 2017. And the idea there is, again, you take you take UEFI, ditch most of it, keep what little you need, the rest of it's Linux. And I gave that talk starting in 2017, because at Google we knew it had to be public or, you know, could get killed. And by the end of 2017, even though we hadn't quite really started using it in production at Google, there were actually companies using it in production and manufacturing and other places because it was a huge improvement over UEFI. So uh, fast forward to December 2020 and we Google's deployed Linux boot at scale with another project I started in 2011 called Uroot. And Uroot is essentially writing all the standard Linux commands in Go or Unix commands in Go. And the trick there is when we build a firmware image in Uroot, we take all the commands and we run them through the Go AST package. And those commands are turned into a package. So LS becomes the LS package date becomes the date package, then we compile them all into one binary. And you get all these efficiencies because it's now one source, not many sources. And so we can turn, I think we have 130 commands now, but we can turn those commands into a, a binary. Once it's compressed, we have a three meg init RAM with 130 commands that are based in Go that we can put in a flash part. And so that's how we deploy firmware at Google now. Does Okay, I got we got like ten minutes left, but now I got to ask you this question because, yeah, you know, the the general consensus is that if you have to remove latency altogether and completely, the GC is kind of in your way there with Go, and this is where Rust maybe shines because there's no garbage collection, and so you're talking about using Go in firmware, you're talking about using Go. <laughs> Uh, at these lower levels, but do you just turn the garbage collection off because it just starts and stops? No, you know what? Here's the key. It doesn't matter. So the, the problem with the garbage collection argument is people need to look at the, the, the use to which you're putting Go, and the garbage collection may or may not matter. Now, certainly for firmware, it doesn't matter. When you're only going to be there for less than a second, GC never comes into play. So it, it really is a, a, a complete non-issue and distraction. And the, the, the thing you want to do is you want to have a build process that's reasonably fast. You want to produce binaries that are reasonably compact. You want the code to be easily understood by anyone. And, you know, I've been looking at some of these things. I, I, I write Rust. I'm not very good at it, but I do write Rust because of the Orboot project, which is firmware and Rust. And they, they talk about zero cost abstractions, you know, but the, the thing is, it's not for people mentally, it's not zero cost. I mean, some of these, some of the macro packages are just absolutely impenetrable. And further, our friends writing firmware in Rust, they keep, it's pretty easy to crack open a bug or two when you're working at that level in Rust. And so I've, I've really thought hard about the whole Rust v Go thing. And, and my feeling is there are times when the, the GC is, is a non-problem. Um, there are times when, so, so there are times when what Go brings to the table are, are compelling and you go with Go. And there are times when what Rust brings to the table are compelling and you go with Rust. But the, the big mistake I think anybody would make would be, and this is happening, would be to say unconditionally one is the one you use in all cases. It's just simply not true. So you, you have to look very carefully at what you're doing and um, and, and and evaluate, right? Because there, there are cases where Rust is really actually a bad deal. <laughs>
I, I, I do training where I show people once you're, if you write the code in a certain idiomatic way and you can do things, I can run it with the GC on and, and with the GC off and the difference is so small it's like it doesn't exist, right? Like they've done such an amazing job with the with getting out of your way. Actually, I would be interested in your training, to be honest. That sounds interesting. But I, I know the guy who's been working on the GC for a couple of years at Google, and um, you know, well, one guy retired, the one guy's still there, and they're just absolutely they're pretty brilliant, and and the things they managed to do in the GC are just absolutely incredible. So yeah, I I. Um, I hear all these arguments. The, the, the arguments ignore a few things, to my view, which is one is that, in some sense, underneath you, there's a kernel, and the kernel's doing GC anyway. So the, the claim that there's no GC because you're using Rust is just a tad bogus. Um, I mean, it's there, right? There's a reality to it, right? There are, there are real advantages to Rust. You can see them. I see them mostly in firmware, but there's no question that they exist. But at the same time, the, the, the where people tend to go wrong is if if you kind of look at a micro up this is like it's like looking at a micro optimization and driving all your decision making from that. So we've been really happy with um, with Go in in the firmware. You know, it's running user mode, but it's essentially firmware Linux and Go, and this Go stuff, and it is actually really widely used. So if you look at a company like ByteDance, they're they're they've deployed this stuff to their data centers, and there are actually too many companies to name at this point, but Google definitely, we deployed it at scale back in December, 2020. We're, our use of it's only growing. And we, it's not that we haven't looked at Rust, it's just we've taken a look at whether maybe this is, you know, would we do this again in Rust? And the answer is, eh, not so sure, not so sure. Don't, I think people got into this mindset that if it's not as the fast as it could be, they're not a good programmer or they're less than what they could be or something. I, it was this weird, I felt it in the industry. Just I'm a regular application level average developer, right? But you always felt it. Like if you weren't writing performant code, you were not like a hardcore programmer. And it made people feel bad. And I've got to tell people, is it fast enough? Is it fast enough? And yet the other measure in, in the supercomputing world is time to solution. So there's, if you spend six months optimizing the hell out of something, so it'll run in, you know, five and 5.8 months instead of six months, you've wasted your time, right? So you, you really have to look at that balance. And, and you also have to look at who's going to take care of this stuff when you're done. So there, you know, you might want to look, I, if you haven't seen Tamago from S-Secure, it's really worth a look. It, it's Go running on bare metal. And what I found really amazing is that the internal packages you use for in, communication inside the Tamago kernel are the Go OS and, and FS packages. And that broke my brain when I found out what was going on. I actually have a project called T9 that's based on Tamago. But I talked to those guys and they said, you know, we started with Rust. And we ended up with Go because there's, there's a certain amount of, of, of complexity that comes with Rust. And, and there's a, there, are a few, there's, there are things that are a little frightening about Rust, okay? If you use a package and somebody does something stupid and uses unsafe somewhere in the package in a way they shouldn't, all your guarantees are gone. And this has happened. And, and so I keep, I keep worrying about the level of trust of what the compiler is able to do. Because I mentioned Burroughs. Well, Burroughs depended heavily on the compiler protecting you against you know, the fact that the hardware didn't actually have a lot of protection. So this is not a new story, the idea of having a lot of information and knowledge in a compiler to protect you. It's not a new story. It's a 50-year-old story, and it hasn't always worked. And, you know, there, we use the heapless package in Orboot, and the guys at Oxide tell me they just found kind of a nasty problem in the heapless package, which they fixed, that has actually, we think, been bedeviling us for about two years. So, you know, it, it's a cool language, but but for everybody to jump on and say this is all you need, it, it's just really not well thought out, my view. I, I love all these, I teach all these things, uh, at, at, like the beginning of the class, it's all, and I've learned it all because of Go and, and, and the people that have worked on it, right? Like these, these need to be your priorities. And it's nice to hear you saying it 
and saying it where you're doing these lower level projects and and those are your priorities readability maintain i tell people all the time stop writing code like you're the only one maintaining it like you got to write it for the next person or it's gone the moment you leave it's gone that's current current hands what i think it's current hands you said it you know it's twice as hard to debug it as it is to write it so make damn sure when you write it it's easy to read right and very true you know and yeah, you see things. The other thing about Go, which does come from the Bell Labs mindset, is try and make sure there's only one way to do a thing. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had discussions with people about, oh, here's how you're going to write this iterator in Rust. And everybody comes up with a different thing, and they're all valid, right? And and so I I, I go back and forth between, between Go and Rust. I find things in Rust, and then I say, oh, God, I wish Go had that, right? But at the same time, um, I frequently find things in Go and think, yeah, I kind of wish Rust were like this. I mean, you know, a simple one, like in, in, in Rust, you say, you know, um, thing implementation for, you know, type, right? You say, here's my here, tra implementation of this trait for this type, right? Or, you know, in Go, like, you write functions for your type, and if they satisfy an interface, they satisfy the interface. You don't have to wrap them in this this implementation thing. And, and you don't think about that much. So at some point I realized, you know, I really like this in Go that I don't have to have this stuff around my functions and say, this is the implementation for this interface, right? That if I implement the interface, I've implemented the interface. So it, it allows you to streamline because now the responsibility of you trying to think in the future that somebody's going to need to satisfy this goes away. You just write the interface. If you need the, if you need the abstraction, define the abstraction for yourself. And it's mind blowing, right? Like once that light bulb goes on. And then and there's just a lot of little things in Go, and I go to Rust and think, eh, okay, I kind of think Go made a better decision here. But then I'm in, then I'll be in, then I'll be in Rust and think, well, oh, okay, that's actually kind of neat. There's this thing in Rust where you kind of say, uh, initialize this struct, and then you say, I think it's something like, oh, and take everything else that is in, is in this other struct. And it's just a, it's a shorthand convenience. I, I'm not. I'm not so sold on the whole Rust thing with the question mark blow out of the function early. I, I think, they, do, you, do you remember when they're having that discussion about error handling and Go and they were looking at sort of some of these shorthands and they finally said, you know what, it's okay. It's more code, but it's okay. I think I'm in agreement with Russ on that one. It's like, you know, it, a little more code, error handling is critical to get right. Just, just have a little more code. Yeah, it's the, the my core philosophy. You make things easy to understand, not easy to do. Yep, that's even a really good way to put it. Uh, even if it's going to be a little more tedious, because your time right now at 2 o'clock is easy, there's no stress. The, the the bug in production stress, and you want to be able to move quickly there. No, I mean, that, I like that. That's a really good way to put it. I, I, I really agree with you there. Anyway, I guess we're at our two-hour mark, so I will... We are, yeah, we are out of, I wish we weren't, but we are out of time. And I, I so appreciate you telling your story and uh, all the different things that you've worked on. It's, it's amazing. Well, it's great talking to you. If you get the Google coming, I mean, California, I should say, um, Bay Area, let me know. It'd be great to see you in person. Yeah, for sure. Once we're done COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still going to get through that. Um, Ron, just real quick. Um, we'll, we'll have everything in the show notes when this gets released, but if, uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, uh, ask you questions maybe after the show, is there any, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you? I just, you know, it's just rminick at gmail.com. That's fine. Yeah, that would be fine. I'm happy to talk to people. Uh, I, I am actually always looking for people who want to muck about with Go. I, we need... We need more people involved in Uroot. We need reviewers, we need coders, you know. Um, so, and there's other things. Uh, there's a new project I started just in the last few months called Sorcery. I'll be talking about it, the OpenSUSE thing in June. It's uh, github.com slash u dash root slash sorcery. It's um, intended to be a portable across architectures and portable across kernels root file system. And the trick is it it's, Boots with eight binaries and everything's compiled on demand. So if, if people would like to look at that and maybe critique it and show better ways to do it and all this sort of thing, I'm always open to contributors. That's brilliant. All right, yeah, we'll get that in the show notes too so people can, um, can check that out. All right, Ron, thank you again for all of your time today. Yeah, take care, Bill.
Uh, talking so, to you so this is Bill Kennedy and Ron saying thank you for spending time with us today at the R Labs podcast, and I hope to see everybody again real soon.